I'm in my guest bedroom tonight. Hi. Eddie's hanging something for me. Hi! Oh, gosh, guys. I'm in my bedroom, or the guest bedroom tonight in my, my office at the apartment. I went to the Champer today to write, and Rowena stayed here. I got the door kind of propped open with my sign, <laughs> just in case she goes in, because I don't like to hear all Eddie's noise, all Eddie's business back in there. Anyways, um, oh, there she is. Hey, Rowena. What are you doing? Hi, Rowena. She can't stand it. She's so Oh, there's some people watching. Let's see. Oh, there's a lot of people. Um, hi, Kathy Galvin. Hi, Michelle Bernstein. Michelle, I just mailed off your top fan prize today. Hi, Jean. Those top fan prizes, there were so many that I have to do them in increments um, because the post office lady hates me. So I take some in during the day and then at night, like after this, um, I've been going to the post office, but actually the reason why I'm late is because I went to the post office before this and then I hope to have to hop over to Walgreens to get, um, uh, a birthday card for Karen. You know, Karen and the Cozy Crew that runs my Cozy Crew for birthdays this week. And one of her presents I have not sent. So, I've got to send that. It's going to be late. I need to get a birthday card. It's all going to be late. So I'm like the worst ever. But, I was at Walgreens in my county and you know, my son Brady was in a separate town, and he was at Walgreens with his husband and her mother. I've never met her mother. This is where I was going. I met her mother. I was so embarrassed. But I got to hug Brady. <laughs> it's so, uh, you know, look at early. It's so, uh, anyway, so uh, we have one of those flex cards, and he had just texted me today and said, Hey, I'm going to the doctor. It's, uh, of course, we let them use the flex card. The kids, we let them use it still, even though they're grown up. We let them use it for contacts, doctor's visits, and things like that. They, and I tried to explain it. It's not free money. It's money that's taken out of your dad's paycheck. Just not taxed. It's pre-taxed. But they still think it's free money. So, so... I gave him the flex card when I saw it, but I'm in my exercise outfit. It's so embarrassing. Still embarrassing. Anyways, if y'all are just popping on and you want to know why this crazy lady is talking about Walgreens, oh, where'd you go? It's because we are here for Bedtime Stories of Tanya. What does that mean? That means we are reading a chapter, maybe two tonight, of Beaches, Bungalows, and Burglaries. <laughs> so let's see who else is here. Judy Tucker, good evening to you from wet Wisconsin. It is beautiful here. Um, let's see if I can. I, I keep you guys on my tripod. I'm in front of the window, that's why it's a little clary. But it's pretty here. Oh, my phone says, don't rotate me. So this is the window ledge where Rowena likes to sit. Uh-oh, she likes to sit down there. Oh, there's a lot of static. Hmm, that's odd. I can put my earphones in. I can fix that. I don't know why they're static. Maybe it's because I was whispering. Let me grab my earphones. Hold on. Come on. Uh, no, not even 
shut the door. It's just like a kid. Come on. You coming in? Come on. Come on. Anyways, somebody said they're having a hard time hearing it. I put these in backwards because they hurt my ears when they're the right way. Is that better? No, it's not the AC. Sounds like the shower is running. Running water? No. We do have cicadas, Ralph. It could be. We have a lot. We have those yearly. Some people are like, um, that they like get them every 10 years or something. I'm like, dude, we get them like every night. <laughs> um, that's better. Definitely background air noise. You know what? There is an air conditioner unit outside the building, which probably belongs to everybody else. So it is much better, much better, much better. Yay, it is much better. Okay, everybody. Where did Stinky go? Do you want, she's hiding in the corner. I better let her back out. Hold on. Okay, well, I'm letting you out. Come on. <laughs> so anyways, what I was saying is that I was whispering because it was like secretive. I saw... Um, Brady and his girlfriend and her mom at Walgreens. And that was the first time I've seen her mom. And I'm looking like this. And I'm like, great. I could have at least had on a decent shirt and not a jazzercise shirt. Oh, well. I don't really care about this as much as the uh, leggings. Yeah, I went out in leggings. I know it's wrong. It's wrong. Like Dottie says, there's two things in the world that tell the truth. Little children and leggings. Um, we have some geckos here. I don't know if they're selling their geckos or they're um, more like lizards. Um, I know, Ralph. She'll want to come back in in a heartbeat. Wear me out. But anyways, this is our guest bedroom in the apartment, which I love and I have made into my office. And so um, in there is the closet. Okay, it does have some clothes hanging up, but it also has like the shelves there have various I've already showed this not that y'all are here to see this but I'm going to show you anyways so it has various things like um that's where Rowena likes to sleep it has various books and some giveaway bags um of course it has like um oops I don't want people to see people's addresses My, you know just some things that I need in the office that I would need um uh to um that I would have in my actual office at home. And so I um, had to have some kind of space here. So anyways, um, why is it wrong? Why is what, what wrong? Joy, hi Joy, how are you? Let's see who else is here. Nice closet, it is a nice closet, isn't it? So I use it for my office closet. Not so shabby. Not so shabby. Um, let's see. Um, we have annual seven year, ten year, thirteen year, seven year, and twenty one year cicadas, says Sharon. Shannon. Um, sorry, Shannon. Um, yeah, you know, um, we have them all the time. I mean, we never have gone. I remember maybe fifteen years ago, um, they were, um, like, really prominent, like a lot of them. Like, we couldn't hardly walk without smishing me. <clears throat> she was talking about why it's wrong to wear my leggings, because I don't look good in leggings. But we ain't here to discuss leggings. We're here to discuss beaches, bungalows, and burglaries. Maybe I should put that shade down. Oh, well. My old eyes can help, too. One of these days, I'm going to have to whip out my glasses. That'll really scare y'all. <laughs> I don't care. Okay, chapter nine. If you need to catch up, you can always catch up in the video section. 
um, on the side of the page and also I have uploaded them to YouTube. So are y'all ready? Chapter nine. You can't leave your clothes in the washer. Queenie was scolding a young girl on the other side of the laundry club. It'll get all mildewed and stinky. She threw her hip to the side and planted her hand on her lime green waistband of the tights she was wearing. Speaking of leggings, right? Who wants to smell a stinky uniform when you're trying to deliver delicious food? I couldn't help but smile. The poor young lady didn't like more than, look more than 20 years old. She had her dishwasher blonde hair pulled up in a high ponytail. I could tell by the length of her ponytail that her hair must have been long because the end of the ponytail went past her shoulders. She had a thick waist and full hips and stood about five foot eight inches tall. There was a look of terror on her face when she watched Queenie push buttons and pour liquids in a cup of the laundry machine. How did the library gig go? Dottie asked. She was sitting at the card table where Queenie's fake crystal ball once sat. Crazy, my brow shot up. First, I got sidetracked when I was putting the return books back on the shelf. I held up a couple of books about normal. I found these in the nonfiction section and was really happy to see that the brochure and the photos in the book look similar. So we can get an, the RV park back in tip-top shape. And now I think we can fi figure out how this whole RV living thing works with books Abby's pulled for me. She also found me some books on how to run a business. That's what you call crazy? Dottie asked and pointed to the coffee station. Fresh pot, go grab you one and fill me back up. She changed her coffee mug with the books on my arm. And the book club book. Yeah, Abby shoved that into my hands after I had to do the story time for the children. I said over my shoulder on the way to coffee and crafts. That was crazy because I've never been good with kids. And Hank, I poured and Dottie interrupted. Detective Sharp, she asked. Yeah, he came in to talk to me and he actually got the kids to do the craft by bribing them with stickers. I walked back with a cup in each hand and sat at them on the table. Did he say anything about the investigation, she asked, which reminded me about what Betts had said about overhearing the older ladies in the community gossip as she cleans their houses. He said that Paul had been dead longer than I'd been in town and he subpoenaed my cell phone records to show that I'd not been in contact with Paul by checking the location feature. Who knew phones were so smart? I brought the cup up to my lips. I told him I didn't do it and I gave him a list of people from normal who might have had motive from normal. That's why I don't have one of them darn cell phones. The government is spying on me. Queenie headed over to the puzzle table and gave what was already a complete one, good once over. No one cares what you're doing, Queenie, Dottie rolled her eyes. Queenie shot, the, shot Dottie a look, but Dottie didn't see it. I gave Queenie a smile to mouth that I cared about her. She grinned. Why do you think it was someone for normal, Dottie shifted in her chair. Because he did a lot of people wrong here, and he was found here, not just money either. I gnawed on the thought of whether I should ask her about the conversation Abby heard and just went for it. Dottie! I put my cup down and reached over the table, cupping her hands in mine. I understand Paul gave you a sob story, but I also understand that he was planning on firing you. How did you know that? She jerked her hands away and leaned further back in her chair, crossing her arms over her chest. I'm finding out really fast that normal is a very small. People talk around here, even to strangers. I circled my finger on my mug and sat there in silence. You think I killed him? She leaned forward and tapped her fingernail on the table. Well, that just beats the band, Mae West. You come watching in our town and we, she circled her finger around the air around her, take in flaws and all because, honey, you've got a lot more issues than Time Magazine. I, I stammered from the, from the little bit of tongue lashing I was getting. It wasn't my intent at all. Don't go and give me no excuse. I didn't kill that sorry sack of you know what, and I don't have to explain nothing to you or Hank Sharp. She jumped up and grabbed her pleather cigarette case that she had on with the top snap closure. In a flash, she scurried over to the door and shoved it open, causing the glass door to slam into the outside wall of the building and light her cig as she sat on the curb of the sidewalk. Now, what did you do? Queenie glowered at me and rushed to the door to Dottie's side. I sat there wondering how to make the situation right, but she sure was acting guilty instead of just telling me about the fight. I thought as I switched her stiff lips fussing as the smoke rolled out of each word. 
Every ounce in a while, every once in a while, she jabbed the air with her cigarette and fingers toward me. Excuse me, the young girl who Queenie was helping got my attention. She held on, she had on a black pair of skinny, she had on a pair of black skinny jeans with black Converse tennis shoes on. Do you know how to start this dryer? Mine broke and my boyfriend is out of town. Sure. In fact, I didn't, don't, I didn't know how to use it until yesterday. My heart tugged knowing that without Dottie, I'd never survived the past couple of days in normal where nothing was normal. Really? She questioned. Really? I think we should write the directions down and post them, don't you? I took her quarter and shoved her, sh showed her what the best option was for the quick dry cycle since she didn't have a whole lot. That would be a good idea. Thanks, she nodded and went back to the bookshelf. No problem. I glanced back out the door on my way back to the front. Queenie was rubbing Dottie's back and Dottie had her forehead planted in the palms of her hands. I may. I wanted her to feel welcome because it was only a few short days ago that I was here in her shoes and didn't know a soul in the laundry club. I recalled how good I felt when they helped me out and I wanted to pay kindness forward. Trudy Bull, she said. Trudy Bull. Aww. It's nice to meet you and I'm so glad you helped me. She put her hands in prayer pose with a small bow. I can write down some directions. That way no one will bother you, bother me with it. Queenie grumbled and walked over to the bookshelf where she where there was a pad of paper and pen stuck in the coffee mug. After I helped Trudy, I thought it was about time to start taking responsibility for all of my actions, not just Paul. I headed outside and ignored Dottie's underbreath comments on how I wasn't invited to their little party. I'm crashing it. I sat down on the curb next to her and realized I'd never sat on a curb before. I owe you an apology. I didn't mean for you to think that I thought you killed Paul. I know he did wrong. And even though he was a criminal, he was my ex-husband. And he was great up until the FBI raided our house. I'm trying to work through all those feelings I have. Was he the real man I fell in love with five years ago and married only a few years ago? Was he the man that took everyone's money and a criminal? Did he get caught up into something that ju he just couldn't get out of? I shook my head. These are questions as someone who is trying to make his actions right that I'm asking myself. I think I need to figure out who killed him and why in order to move on. In the process, you're willing to say that I did it to Hank? Dottie asked. I never once asked if you killed Paul. You didn't. He asked if I knew anyone who in the RV park would want Paul dead. Trust me, you're not the only one. I told him that someone got to Paul before me. Both of us laughed. I'm sorry. If you want to know about the conversation, I'm more than happy to tell you, she said, and put the cigarette out on the edge of the curb. He came by once a month to collect my any lot feeds and gave, and I gave you that printout. A few of the people on the list, I paid their fee with what little money I'd got paid from Paul. He must have known something was coming down the pipeline with all his dealings because the last time I heard from me, he told me that he was going to come live here and take over. When I asked him about my job, he said, and I repeat, toots! Times are hard. I've got to do what I've got to do. She didn't take too. She didn't take too kindly to being called toots. Queenie said in a matter of fact way with a hard nod. I was there. Me and Henry. She had a good comeback. I'm afraid that comeback just might be what'll get me in trouble. Dottie twirled the edge of her curl around her finger. I told him which way was which and how ashamed he should be about taking people's money. I wasn't stupid. I watched them big news channel. When I started to talk to people around here, they started telling me how he'd been investing their money or something like that. I'm not going to lie. I was the one who called the FBI. I gave the tip and I even warned Paul telling him that I was going to get him back. Do you think he was on his way after he broke out of jail to come confront you, I asked? Well, I don't know why he came here. I figured it was for you. But then I wondered if, like you, he had no other place to go, she shrugged. We all looked up as we heard a car approaching. Hank's car. We stood up and waited for him to park. You didn't tell the FBI who you were, I asked. No, I called anonymously. I even did it from a payphone in another town. She put her hand over her brows to shield the shun. Son, he looks like he means business. She dropped her hand and greeted him after he made over to, made his way over to us. Dottie, ladies, he looked at me last. There was a bit of a smirk on his face. 
Dottie, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, Hank. She walked over to the side where he pointed and he followed. Hey, you two. Bets walked up with a couple bags in her hand. She leaned to look around us. What's going on? We don't know. Well, we have an idea, Queenie cocked a brow. We won't even bother giving you a free guess. Paul West, she asked. Mm-hmm. My nose drew a big line up in the air and an equally big one down to my chin. Let's go inside and give them some space. Queenie held the door open for us to walk in. I've got some good stuff for you, Bets held the bag up a little up a little when she walked into the laundromat. I went back to Tough Nickel after how he treated you this morning. I told him how ashamed he should be by treating you that way when I see him every Sunday sitting in the front pew next to his wife. Queenie nudged me. That's why we keep her in the group. She's good at using what we like to call our mama's God guilt. She pulled out twinkly lights, flower necklace, and blow up palm trees, beach themed paper cups with napkins, along with a couple of those flamingo lawn ornaments. They'd seen better days, but wasn't all that chippy looking stuff coming back in style? I got tons more in my car, she beamed with pride. I told Lester that if what, what you were doing and how you were going to bring back the tourists to normal and how good it was going to be for the community to see you in church, we had a lot of leftovers from the beach thing vacation Bible school that Lester donated it all. Did you say see me in church? I pointed to myself. Why, yes, you're now part of the community. Her smile faded when she realized I wasn't smile. You do believe in church, right? Um, I bit the inside of my cheek. Yeah, but I've not been in a long time, and I mean a long time, so maybe you should take all, take it all back, I gulped. Don't be silly. We'll see you in church on Sunday, she patted my arm and headed back to the door that read office in rectangle uneven letters. You just got Mama God guilted, Queenie drew her hands up over her head and tipped over her to the waist, bending down to touch her t- touch the ground. I've got to get to class. You got to go. Good for stress. No, I don't want to talk to Dottie and get a jump on cleaning the RV park. I watched out the door when I saw Hank was walking back to his car and left Dottie standing there with her shoulders slumped. Strike classes in the morning. Dottie did some sort of mood that was supposed to be resemble her hitting a punching bag, but it looked more like a wet noodle to me. You should come. Maybe one day. I was promising a lot of one days to people around here. One day church, one day jazzercise. I wondered if that one day would come. I pushed the door open and poked my head out. Are you okay? Queenie pushed back, pushed past me and got a got a what gave a wave over her shoulder. I've got to get to class, but I'll call after dance mix, Dottie acknowledged her. I'll see you in the morning, Queenie said to Dottie, only this time she kicked her leg to the side. <laughs> I'm going to he- <laughs> I'm going to head back <laughs> sorry, that's funny. I'm going to head on back home. Dottie let out a big sigh. Do you need a ride? I was hoping you'd ask. I'd offered a peace offering smile smile. Then we can talk about it on the way, she dug her keys into her pocket. Let me grab the stuff Bets brought and tell her goodbye. I'll be right back. I swung the door open and walked back over to Bets's office, knocking on it. She called for me to come in. Hey, I'm heading back home with Dottie. Do you want me to grab the stuff from you, I asked. I can bring it over in the morning while I give you a ride to the library. That is, if you need a ride. She was sorting through some paperwork on her desk. That sounds perfect. I'll see you tomorrow. I looked at Bets for a moment longer before I headed out to meet Dottie's old pickup truck. Hank said, I'm a suspect, Dottie spoke with the unlit cigarette stuck between the corner of her lips. She jerked the, you know, I think I have a fake cigarette. No joke. I should probably get that for tomorrow night's reading. That would be hilarious. Anyways, we'll start all over again. Hank said, I'm a suspect, Dottie spoke with an unlit cigarette stuck between the corner of her lips. She jerked the gear shift that was on the neck of the steering wheel down into drive. He said that he had some folks coming forward with some information about my conversation with him. I actually bought Paul and I were friends up until the last time he called. I'm sorry. I made everyone feel like they were important. His He made everyone feel like they were important in his life. I just looked at all the people invested with him and gave him all their money. I looked out the window as we headed out of town. I'm one payment away from my camper being taken away. She curled her lips together like Henry. I had some savings. My husband and son were killed in a car crash. I looked over. I swallowed hard. The trucking company that hit and killed them gave me a real big settlement. Her voice trailed off. Please don't tell me that you. I didn't have the heart to finish my sentence. By the look on her face, I knew what the answer was to my question. Can you stop 
Dottie brought the car to a halt in the middle of the street, right in front of Normal Diner. What's wrong? she asked. I forgot I was going to meet someone about the fundraiser at the diner. I planted my hand on my forehead, on my, my planted my palm on my forehead. I'm forgetting a lot of things lately. Do you want me to wait? she asked. No, you go on home and get some rest. We're going to figure out what Paul did. Who did this to Paul? I pinched a smile. You aren't the only one in normal that wanted to kill Paul. We're going to continue on with chapter 10. Is that all right? We're going to keep it going, people. Chapter 10. The diner actually was really cute, just like the rest of the shop in Normal. It was cozy and very southern, small townish. It was a shotgun style with a long counter down one side with the kitchen and working, and working guts behind it and row of red sparkly leather booths along the other side that butted up to a long row of windows. The smell of grease, bacon, beef... Beef and cinnamon filled the air along with the sounds of chatter and utensils hitting the plates. I looked around and the only seat not taken was at the counter. It just so happened to be located right in front of the pie stand. I stepped up on the platform where all the single chairs along the counter were bolted down and slid on the red sparkly leather, which was the same sparkly leather on the benches. I swiveled the chair seat around with my hands folded on top of the counter. Hiya, Trudy Bull. Trudy Bull. Y'all, Trudy Bull. I know. I'm not going to spoil any of the series for y'all. Poor Trudy Bull. Trudy Bull was standing in front of me with an apron tied around her waist, a pin stuck behind her ear. The door, the diner logo, a coffee cup with steam curling out of the top was embroidered on the front. What do you want to eat? She tapped the top of the pie stand with her pen. Or you can go straight for a slice of apple pie. Best around. Now it made sense why Queenie told Trudy people didn't want to smell like mildew when she was serving food. First, tell me what's good, I asked and plucked the menu from between the salt and pepper shaker. Everything now, she leaned over and whispered. I wouldn't have said that about six months ago, but our head chef wasn't here then. But now, she put her lips together and kissed the tops of her fingers. The new chef makes the grease taste good. I'll have whatever you think is good. I picked up the menu and put it back where I found it. What happened six months ago? The chef's dad, who was the chef and the owner, she flip-flopped her hand, had a heart attack. Apparently, it was about a guy they found at the lake over at the trailer park. RV park, I, I corrected her. I live there. It's RVs and campers. She gave me an odd look. I don't think I've ever seen you there. It's because you haven't, Trudy. Ty Randall appeared in the window between the diner and the kitchen. She's the new owner of Happy Trails, or should I say the owner all along. The own, oh, her lips formed a oh. You mean that you're Mae West? And how did you hear about me, I asked. As far as I know, I'm just the nice lady that helped you figure out the dryers in the laundry club. She smiled, but it quickly faded when Ty hit the dingy bell. Table six up, he yelled extra loud. The entire diner fell silent. I knew I was going to like you when I heard your name, she winked. One order of campfire hash coming right up. She jerked her head up to Chester towards Ty. He's how I know who you are. Trudy moved out of the way, exposing the pass through window. Ty was still staring at me. He whipped the towel off his shoulder and disappeared, only to reappear through the swinging kitchen door at the far side of the counter. He, he hurried past the counter and found his way between me and the customer next to me. Sorry, Dan. He nudged Dan and took his ticket. Supper's on me tonight. You gotta move or go, but I need this seat. Here's your hat and what's your hurry, Ty? Dan said with some sarcasm as he stood up and picked up his bowl of soup. Why are you here? I told you I'll have your money. Ty sat down next to me, his knees touching my seat and keeping me from swiveling away. There's no need to harass me at work like your ex. I told him and now I'm going to tell you. His voice trailed off. He ran his hands down his face before his chest rose in a big, head, a big inhale. What did you tell me? What did you tell my ex? I was curious. Listen, he jerked my chair around so I faced him. He was so close that I could smell a mix of muscalone and grease. I'm not going to lie. It was a nice smell. And his blue eyes were what I'd attribute to the flip in my stomach, too. 
I won't have you come in here again or I'll call Hank Sharp. Are you telling me that Hank Sharp hasn't come in here to ask you about Paul's death? I wondered, but knew I was putting a little voice in his head. I'm not telling you anything. I don't know you. I don't need to tell you anything. All you need to know is that I'm going to have your money to you and I'm looking for a new place for me and the boys, he planted his hands on the counter. If you'll excuse me now, he said in a huff, and get out of my diner. One campfire hash, Trudy started to say and put down the plate that looked good, but Ty jerked it out of her hands. She's leaving, he told Trudy and took the plate, disappearing with it back into the kitchen from where he'd come. There was no sense in trying to say somewhere I was obviously not welcome. True, I didn't go in there to eat, but to get some information. I wasn't looking forward to a walk back to the campground. It was that weird time of the late afternoon, almost dark, but was still a little light out around 9.30 in the evening. And since it was only 6 p.m., the sun was still out, and the only place that looked to be open was the bank. There was no better time to look into a line of credit and to come do what I was going to do with some of Paul, some of the cash from Paul's sock drawer. The bank wasn't exactly what I'd pictured it to be. A regular bank? Nope. Normal trust company had one teller window and one office. There was a small table in the middle where there was some extra deposits and withdrawal slips like a regular bank would have, but on a very small scale. Is that a real Gucci? The lady behind the teller desk looked at my purse. She pushed up her elbows to lean over the counter and get a better look. It is. It was one of my gifts that I'd smuggled out of the pile of items that the FBI had seized. My designer bag days were over for now and I had this last one to cling on to. Mmm, she gave me the side eye. I've never seen a real ones. Only the ones in the magazines down at the Safeway. Safeway? I asked. Mm, the grocery store, she straightened her posture and pulled back her shoulders. How can I help you? She looked at her watch. And make it quick. I've got three minutes until six, according to my watch, and I don't care what I'm in the middle of. It just stops. If someone here to talk about a line of credit, I pointed to the desk. Mr. Dieters, she yelled toward the open bank vault that was next to her desk. Dieters, I questioned. Any relation to Alvin Dieters, I asked. You can't get any more relation than the real guy, Alvin walked out of the vault. Mrs. West, I figured you'd been here earlier, but Ann said I didn't have any visitors other than my wife. She brings me lunch every day at the store, so I can come on over here in the afternoon to work my banking hours. I should have known. I brushed my hand through my hair. My fingers got hung in the curls. You are the bank manager? That's right, and that's why I told you to come to the bank. He pinched a tight smile and used his pointer finger to push the tip of his cowboy hat up to smidgen. But as you can see, it's closing time, and we've only got about 40 seconds to do some business. Fine. I'm going to make an anonymous deposit. I dug down in my purse and pulled out a stack of $100 bills. Anne, I looked at the name on the plate of the counter. Anne Rose, do you know Dottie Swaggart? I do, she said. Her eyes had focused on the hundreds. Can you please deposit this money into her account? I asked. Where'd you get that money from? Alvin demanded to know. Don't take that if it's blood money. My cell phone rang. I tried to keep my breathing and hands steady when I saw it was Grady Cox. Paul's longtime friend and one of the investors on the list that I'd mentioned to Hank. I sent it to a voicemail and slipped away, my phone in my pocket. I'd call him back when I was ready to talk to him. I'm sure he just wanted me to know that he thought of Paul. He wouldn't be the first person to have called me. It's not blood money. I did have a life before I was married, and this is mine. So I might have told a little white lie, but it was for good re- for help, good for helping someone out. They didn't need to know. I just wanted to do something right. I told you earlier that I was going to make it right with people in normal, and Dottie practically worked for free the past couple of years, and I don't want her to do that anymore. Now I, that I'm the new owner, I thought you said you didn't have anything to put down for a line of credit to fix up the park, he asked with a suspicion in his eye. I have a little money that I want to use to help others, but that doesn't concern you. It appears that we have only about 15 seconds. I pushed the hundreds towards Ann, if you don't mind. 
Anne slid a look over to Alvin, who gave her a nod. I stood there waiting for the transaction to be completed, and I took the teller receipt. Thank you, Anne, I forced a grin, and I twirled around on my toes as I mentally prepped myself for walking journey I was about to embark on. Not that I didn't like walking, I did. I didn't like the fact that I didn't have transportation other than the camper. It felt good and happy that I'd given Dottie some money. It definitely wasn't enough, but it was a start. The sun was shining down on my face, and I wasn't in an ideal living situation, but I couldn't complain. I had a roof over my head, a few new friends, and food. I wasn't going to let a little thing like not having all the cash I needed to fix up the campground or the fact that I was going to have to walk miles and miles out of town to get me down. After all, I had a purpose come since coming to normal. I had to fix up the campground and also help Dottie get off the hook. Help Dottie get off, help get Dottie off the hook. I was careful to hug the pavement on the edge of the road. I'd heard awful tales of, and seen terrible news reports about people getting hit, and that was something I didn't want to happen to me. So when I heard a car coming, I took a step off the pavement and into the grass and waited for it to pass. Only the car didn't pass. It pulled over. I'd recognize that black car from anywhere. Instead of giving Hank Sharp the time, I walked right on past him. You don't want to ride? I heard him all out the window. I'm going to the campground. My continued walking apparently didn't give him the hint because he drove his car slowly next to me, giving me that charming southern smile with that passenger side window rolled down. I know you're upset with me, he appeared to be enjoying this. What gave you that impression, I asked. I, I don't know, maybe you're not stopping when I could give you a ride, or maybe because you didn't answer me. Just a guess, though. He stopped and put his car in park, and when I heard his door shut, I stopped walking and turned around to find him jogging up on me. If you aren't going to stop, I'll just come to you. He picked up the pace when I picked up the pace. I'm taking a walk, I shrugged and continued to look forward. You know, exercise. Funny, because I hear that you've been snooping around the diner. He was relentless. I think it's funny that you don't feel like you need to keep tabs on me, I stopped and looked at him. Is that legal? I pointed to his car. Because I don't think so, and I can call citizen's arrest. Been watching Andy Griffith, he laughed. Who? I questioned. You don't know about what the Andy Griffith show is, his brows furrowed. Listen, I just want to do my walk, so if you don't mind, I turned and started walking. I think I've got your husband's killers. His words brought me to a screeching halt. I turned back around. I thought that'd get your attention. This time, his smile was like the cat that caught the canary. Now, can I drive you back to the trailer park? RV park, I corrected him and walked, I walked back towards him and then pushed past. Only because I'm curious. Curiosity always got the cat, he laughed, and I could hear his footsteps behind me. You love this little cat and mouse game between us, don't you? I glared at him from the passenger side and over the hood. Technically, I don't know who killed your husband, he said once he got into the car. I just wanted to get you in the car so you don't walk on this road. It can be dangerous. X, I grabbed the door handle and jumped out. His hand was much quicker on the lock. I jerked myself back in the seat. I'm pretty quick. You should see me draw a gun, he laughed and put the car in drive. This is kidnapping, I informed him and put the seatbelt on. No, it's saving your life. People drive on these Curry's roads like the Indy 500. You, ha you do know that, right? He sped up. Well, of course I do, I folded my arms. I might be stuck in his car for a few minutes, but I certainly didn't have to talk to him. I checked out Grady Cox, and I can't seem to find him. He kept his eyes on the hands on the wheel. I went to his house today. His wife said that she filed a missing persons report. You know when that was? How would I know, I asked and took out my phone. Take a guess, he teased. I don't want to take a guess. I rolled down the window to get a bit of air. The thought that Grady had called me while he was missing made my stomach nauseous. The same day your husband was killed, he flipped the blinker on to turn into the campground that ticked like a gong in my ear. He called me today. I held my cell phone out. He didn't leave a message. When did he call you, he asked and stopped the car in front of Dottie's camper. He called me less than an hour ago. I'd gone to the bank to try to get a line of credit to help fix up this place, but didn't realize Alvin Dieter was also the bank manager. I shook my head and started to laugh. I'm beginning to think that luck just isn't with me. Are you sure he didn't leave a message, he asked. Here, I held it out to him. Look for yourself. He's not been home, according to his wife. She did file a report. I went over to the police department. 
He turned the car off and the doors unlocked. The door locks popped up. Maybe she's lying and she killed Paul. She knew it and filed a report to show that he was missing when he, she knew he isn't. I thought it sounded good, but that he blew it out of the water. Why would she do that if he was guilty? Wouldn't he just stay and act as if nothing happened and not have her file a report that would bring attention to him? He did that smile thing. Leave the detective work to me and I'll leave picking up all those weeds around the lake to you. Funny, I said with a sarcastic tone. I hear you and Dottie have some friends since you and Dottie have become friends since you've been here. His southern tone was a velvet yet edged with steel. She's been very kind and helpful, I shrugged. Is that against the law around here? No, but she was seen with Paul the afternoon before he floated up to the top of the lake. You, the two of you in cahoots, you might have not been in town, but she sure was, and the gun we found in Happy Trails Lake was registered to Dottie. Really? Hearing this sent shocks of icy fear through me. I'd generally been a good judge of character in the past and thought Paul had just been a good, good at fool of me, but apparently my instincts about people were off, way off. Oh, that's good, he wagged his finger at me. Great poker face. She told me she hadn't seen him in forever, I gulped, and wondered if that odd saying about keeping your enemies closer was what she was doing with me. The fact was, I didn't know her, and it would be easy for her to cover up anything. All these people drip with southern charm, which makes it hard to distinguish anything real. And no, we aren't in cahoots. Are you sure it wasn't just gossip? Because a lot of that goes on around here. They were caught on video at the bank. I'm going to have her bank record subpoena to see if there are any wire transactions to her account. His words alarmed me. Well, I just put money in her account without knowing. Nervously, I ran my hands down, her, down through my hair. I was just, why? How much? His brows formed a V as he stared at me. Just a thousand dollars to help her get by. She told me that Pa hadn't paid her well and any money she did have, she used to pay off some of the lot fees that the campers owed. I only wanted to help her. My voice trailed off. You have one thousand dollars to give away, Mae West? His jaw softened. He shot me a twisted smile. I thought you were broke. How much more money do you have? I don't have much. I'm not a suspect, so it's none of your business. My voice was rough with anxiety. Now he was making me think Dottie Swagger did have something to do with Paul's murder. Well, now that you tell me that, it's possible, you know, Dottie, before this little act you've put on here, after all, his tone hardened ruthlessly, you are an actress, right? May West, whatever I said and jerked the car door open. What are you doing? Dottie asked after both of us had gotten out of the car. I've come to get an official statement from you or if you want to come down to the station, I can take you down and bring you back. He tapped the top of his car with his hand. Nope, I've got nothing to hide. You're more than welcome to come in and I'll answer anything you want to know. Dottie waved him in. It was my cue to go. The weeds that I'd not noticed before he pointed them out were worse than I thought. After I'd gotten my file and person to the camper, I threw on a pair of shorts and t-shirt. There was no better time than the present to pick those weeds because I wasn't getting any sort of loan to help me hire anyone. I needed the exercise and to get out to get what Hank had told me about Dottie and Paul on that tape out of my head for the time being. Maybe all the talk about exercise being good for stress and some, was something I needed to explore. I was stressed out to say the least. The lake was still green and murky. I reminded myself to take on one project at a time. The weeds had to be pulled in order for people to stand around the lake. That was where I was going to start. About 15 minutes into the tedious task, I, a few more of the campers had come outside and began to pick weeds with me. Before I knew it, the entire campground, minus Dottie Swaggart, was around the lake helping me pull the weeds. See what a little teamwork can do, Henry said with a big black bag filled with weeds in his hand. Both of us stood there looking over at the over the lake at the campers. They were all talking and laughing and getting ready for the nightly supper. I never lived in a community where everyone took care of each other. My eyes welled with tears of the joys of kindness filtered and flittered <clears throat> inside my heart. There were no amount of money or big mansions I ha that had mansions I had once 
I had once had that would make me want to go back to the life I'd been living. Are you okay? Henry asked. I'm fine, more than fine, I thought. As I was living the life I wanted, I gulped. I was so wrong. Normal ain't much, but we do have some good folks around these parts. Henry shook his head and left me with my feelings. Normal will be, will be, normal will be much. I tugged my shoulders back. If a little bit of weedy made the place look, look much better, I could only imagine what a little more elbow grease would do. I promise you that, I whispered to myself. That night, I sat down at the table with a small plate of food from all the fire pits that gathered around the lake and started to make a list about the murder in my RV files. There were some murmurs about Paul's death and even a rumor or two about the national news coming to town from some sort of press conference the next day. Dottie and Henry had both been victims of Paul, according to Dottie. Hank said that the FBI thought someone in the park knew he was there. I wrote their names on a piece of paper as well as Ty Randall's. Under Dottie's name, I wrote motive and started to make a list under it. She invested a lot and lost her savings to Paul's scheme. She felt sorry for Paul initially and she wasn't getting paid. She was paying lot fees for all the campers and got angry when she realized she wasn't going to get the money or her investment back. When Paul showed up, I hesitated because I was stumped to why they'd even seen what they, I was stumped because, I hesitated because I was stumped to why they'd be seen in town together. That was something I was going to have to explore further, but for now I finished my list. She got angry and shot him. Then I wrote down that I needed to know if she had a gun or a license to have one. The on, And the only way I knew to do that was to snoop in her camper, even though Hank had told me she was her gun. When was this going to happen, I wondered. She was always outside smoking and watching everyone. I moved on to Henry. His motive was that Paul had stolen his $2,000. Henry didn't seem like the killing type. He was helpful and kind, but he remind, remained on the list. Then there was Ty. To me, he seemed to have the biggest motive. I began to wonder what, where he'd moved back from. According to the local gossip, he had a career life outside of normal. It was Paul's fault that the family diner was going to go under, and he blamed Paul for his father's heart attack. I quickly wrote these things down because those were major life-altering things that could make Ty go over the edge. I saw how he reacted when I came into the diner and hadn't done a thing to him. I can only imagine what happened when he saw Paul. I snapped my fingers. That's it, I quickly wrote. The diner is across from the bank. He saw Paul talking to Dottie. He followed Paul or maybe talked to Paul. Either somehow he got Paul back to the campground and shot him. So all of this was speculation. I knew that I had to go into Dottie and Ty's camper to look for clues. That's how they did in the movies. I wouldn't be considered a burglar since I owned the lots their campers sat on, would I? Nah. I talked myself into it and sat back in the kitchen chair to get a good look at Dottie's camper. This looks like a good start. I stretched my arms out over my head with a big yawn. Chapter 10. So we read chapters 9 and 10 tonight. That was a big one. So we learned a lot, guys. What did you think? Let's see. Um, it looks like I have a halo, somebody said. Um, Jane Dietz, I look like a hilarious. Hey, Nova. <laughs> hey, Cheryl, love the book. Thank you so much. I know these people, in fact, some of them are related to me. Oh, honey, aren't they, though? Um, hey, Tammy Hudson. Jane must be having some storms. I love your Dottie voice. Hilarious. Oh, this is what I said. Continue on. Uh-oh, what about Trudy Bull? Don't tell Donna. Donna has not read the other books in the series if she does not know about Trudy Bull. Donna, catch up. Let me know when you're there. Let me know what you think about that plot. Um, hi, Celia. Cecilia. 
Um, Edith made it. Oh, Nova. Yes. I, okay. So yeah, I have some Gucci bags. I love Gucci bags. Um, so, um, yeah. As a matter of fact, I could tell you a story about Gucci bags. So I won't tell you the whole story, but I did hawk my first, you know, I'm divorced. Well, I was divorced years ago and, um, I hawked my ring at a pawn shop and I walked across the street in Cincinnati to Saks Fifth Avenue and bought a Gucci bag with it. My priorities were a little off at that point. <laughs> but I could have really probably used that money, but I was so angry that I went and bought a bag. And I still have, well, no, I don't. I think my sister's carrying it now or has it. I mean, it's been years, but those things hold up like forever. So, uh, anyways, so isn't that hilarious? Um, hey, B. Hey, Emma. She loves May. And that's one thing, like, I am low dollar other than that. Like, I shop at Walmart. I love Walmart. People are like, I can't believe you like Walmart. I love Walmart. But I do love a good handbag, and that's the only handbag I really like. And literally, I mean, I'm not carrying one right now. Um, I've been carrying, um, I don't even know where it's at. It's called the Bandolier, and my phone fits in it, and it hangs over. My kids call me extra. They're like, you're extra. I'm like, I don't know what that is because it's like a chain and it hangs, my phone hangs down and then it has like a little snap on the back where you can put like your um, debit card and your ID. Oh my gosh. I had to, I don't even know where it's at, but I'll have to look. My, like we can't go to the post, the, the courthouse to get new license. So my license has been expired since this COVID thing. So um, I had to send in the money. Um, and just fill out the form. And then they sent me the same photo from the four years ago on a new uh, new driver's license. <laughs> oh, crazy. Um, the Becky Scott likes the camp, loves the camper series. Thank you. Linda said May has a lot to learn. Yes, she does, doesn't she? And um, thank you, Jean, um, Janine. I always am getting you wrong. I did that as a teacher. Oh, Karen, I know. Book, oh, in six minutes, we got book discussion. Karen, I was just saying that your birthday's coming up this week and your present's going to be late. Well, you have a couple presents coming. Some that it might have been shipped off, but um, the ones that I'm shipping out tomorrow is going to be late. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible friend. Everybody loves it. Good. Love the book. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Donna. My May voice is hilarious. Oh, yeah. Donna hasn't caught up to the books yet. Wait till you get to Trudy's book. Um, Chris, Kristen said the only, she hasn't read any of the books. Only one I'm reading now. Linda said, go, girl. Um, Nova said, oh, no, but it's a Gucci. That's awesome. Are y'all talking about me hawking my ex wedding band? My wedding ring. It was a pretty ring, but I hawked it. <laughs> that is a hoot and a half. I know it's terrible. I mean, it's a whole long story. Okay, so I'll tell you, I shouldn't tell you this part. It's terrible. I can't tell you this part. Because, yeah, you know, I have kids by him. <laughs> and I don't want him to know the whole story about the Gucci. Um, oh, I like to look at them, too. I love them. But I love Walmart. Me, too, Kristen. People are like, I can't believe you like Walmart. I'm like, I love it. This is Walmart. I love it. I do. I love it. I could spend hours in Walmart. No joke. Like, when they opened after COVID, they opened up here. I was in Walmart. First thing. Love it. Um, only in Kentucky. <laughs> I know. Uh, they do have that here in North Carolina. Sorry I'm late. You're never late, Meg. We have book. Oh, you guys, we have book club over in the Cozy Crew if y'all want to pop over there in a minute. Um, Karen said, spoiler alert, watch book discussion. We are discussing all she wrote over in the Cozy Crew. You should come over. If you don't know what the Cozy Crew is, maybe Karen, 
she has like one minute can put it in the um, comments and you can pop over there even if you didn't read the book it's still fun still lively are your books in the stores some of them are um, you can like the ghostly series the ghostly southern mystery series the Kenny Lowry series the um, Southern Cake Baker series that's written under my pen name, Mamie Bell, is in the stores. Some Walmarts, some grocery stores can find them, but you can also order them. So if you go into like a Barnes & Noble or something, you can walk up to the counter and order them because my other titles are published exclusively through a contract I have with Amazon. That's why I am Amazon Only Digital. Um, and so that's who I publish those books through. And those Oh, it's returned to sender. Sorry about that, Karen. Those booksellers and Amazon, you know, obviously don't play nice together, but I love Amazon just like I love Walmart. And so I am true to Amazon. So you can always go online and you can order there or you can order from my website. If there's a particular book that you want, you can always message me and see if I have it here and I can send it to you that way because it should be in my store. Um... Kristen said she received the newest one on Amazon. Thank you. Put it in one of your stores. Stories. Oh, I should. I might have. Well, my ex-husband did say when I began writing, he said, uh, do I need to read one of your books? And I said, not unless you want to know how you're going to die. Can't wait for the discussion. You're a nut. <laughs> Now you have to tell us. I got a purse here that looks like the Louis Vuitton from Walmart. Awesome. See, I'm a Walmart shopper too, Karen. That's why we're friends. Walmart gets most of my paycheck back. I know. I love it. Return to sender. Thank you. Going to book club. Yep. I got to head over to book club too, guys. I love you. Thanks so much. I will see you tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Come on over to book club and join us. We'd love to have you.